our words, crucially, our words about Jesus, our confession of faith about him, will either demonstrate salvation or demonstrate condemnation. Words bear spiritual weight. Words point to the state of our heart. They are like a spiritual barometer. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us as we continue a message we began last time, the spiritual weight of words. And Jonathan, what do you mean that words are like a spiritual barometer? Well, we often think that what we say doesn't really matter. We, we make offhand comments and remarks all the time and think so little of them. And Jesus, here in the passage we're going to spend some time in today, he impresses upon us the importance of what we say, and in particular the importance of what we say about him. Our words of response to him in particular will show something of the state of our hearts before him. And so he says, in essence, and we'll see this more fully and look at his teaching, but be careful what you say and pay attention to what you say. Well, we're going to do that today as we continue the message, The Spiritual Weight of Words. If you can, grab a Bible and join us in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter 12 as we continue the message. Here is Jonathan. On this same theme of response, Jesus now proceeds to make one of the hardest statements recorded in the New Testament, a statement that has troubled many believers over the generations, and one I think we need to consider very carefully together. Verse 31, notice it with me. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Those are are sobering words, to be sure. Jesus, who we know is full of grace and patience, who offers forgiveness to the repentant, who offers rest to the weary, this Jesus, and we must hear him, he tells us that there is a sin for which forgiveness is not available, an action to which grace does not extend, a place indeed of no return. Now, if we weren't listening up until this point, we should sit up and listen now. I think we want to know, we need to know, what is this sin? Where is this point of no return, and how do I ensure that I go nowhere near it? Now, I think many believers over time have read this, particularly those with a sensitive conscience, and wondered with some trepidation, is it possible that I have committed this sin and not been aware of it, or committed it by accident at some prior point, or could I possibly commit this sin in the future, and need I live in fear, because this is a fearful thing, need I live in fear of doing so? Those fears can certainly come, and and perhaps there are some here today living with that concern. But I would say this, we need to see that Jesus is not talking directly at this point to those who would follow him and to have a soft heart toward him. He's not speaking to believers. He's not warning us in the first instance of committing this sin. No, remember where we are. Remember who it is he's addressing. Notice the context. It's so very important. Jesus has been gradually revealing more of his identity, more of his mission. He has been careful and deliberate about it. But increasingly, he has been making himself known. In the discussions with the Pharisees about the law and the Sabbath, he has staked a claim concerning his own authority, declaring himself to be Lord of the Sabbath, the truly authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament law. And demonstrating this power and this authority, Jesus healed that withered man's hand on the Sabbath. Jesus has highlighted how, Matthew has highlighted rather, how Jesus has fulfilled the promise and the profile of the promised Savior, the promised servant of the Lord. Recall with me those words of fulfillment from verse 18, Behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And now as if to confirm that he is indeed this promised Savior, Jesus has performed a spirit-empowered miracle releasing the demon-oppressed man and restoring his sight and his speech. Now, as Jesus' messianic identity and spirit-anointed power are revealed in increasing measure, degree by degree, how have the Pharisees reacted? 
when he healed the man on the Sabbath, how did they respond? Verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. When Jesus healed the demon-oppressed man and the power of the Spirit, and the crowds asked, could this be the son of David? Good question. What did the Pharisees say? Verse 24, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. As the evidence mounts that Jesus is the Spirit-anointed Messiah, the Pharisees harden in their response. They reject the clear evidence and declare in all willfulness that the power behind Jesus' ministry is not the Spirit of God, but the devil of hell. And so what is Jesus saying in verse 31? He's saying that he's willing to forgive sin. He's gracious. He's even prepared to forgive blasphemy in some degree, offensive speech against himself, the divine son. But a direct word against the spirit will not be forgiven. And then he clarifies further what he means by that, verse 32. And whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. The name Son of Man is actually the name Jesus uses most frequently for himself in the Gospels. I think I'm right in saying that. It's a title that points in an essential way to his humanity. And in some ways, on first reading, it's a little bit of a lower key introduction. It could be heard as him simply referring to himself as a, as a human being. It means more than that, of course. It has a rich Old Testament background. But the point is this, I think, as he is gradually introduced and revealed in his humanity as the Son of Man, Jesus will forgive words of criticism and confusion if understanding grows and repentance and faith come. But as the full reality of his spirit anointing becomes clear, as his miracles are seen, as the power of the Holy Spirit behind his ministry is shown, and as the confirmation comes of his anointing from the Father as the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord, as this becomes evident and as it is revealed, if someone like the Pharisees with so much knowledge and understanding, if someone looks on with all powers of observation, reviews the evidence, evaluates the Old Testament background, and says with due consideration, the power behind this ministry is not the Holy Spirit of God, but the devil of hell. Therefore, Jesus is absolutely not the anointed Messiah. He is a fraud, not a savior. If someone like one of these Pharisees does this, it amounts to a decisive, informed, belligerent, and blasphemous rejection of Jesus as he truly is. And at that point, there is simply nothing left to be done. That person will have to then accept the dreadful consequence of that decision, for there is no other salvation available to them. Now, friends, this is an extreme case. These are words uttered by accident. These are deliberate, considered, absolute hate-filled. So please don't fear that you've done this sort of by accident without realizing it. These aren't words spoken by those who love Jesus and have a softness of heart toward him. These are words spoken by people who hate him, who have decided absolutely and finally to reject him and who want him dead. And so if you're troubled at all by the fear that you might have ever or might ever in the future do this, take comfort. Your softness of heart toward the Lord, your very concern about these things is an indication that you have not. But Jesus is making things very clear, isn't he? He is engaged in a battle of kingdoms. Each one of us is either for him or against him, and the stakes are high. They could not be higher. Our response, it matters. Eternity is at stake. Neutrality, it's not possible. Our words ultimately show which side we are on. So with all that in mind, let me ask you, what do you have to say about Jesus Christ? Will you acknowledge that the Spirit of God is upon him, that he is the promised servant of the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior King, the Son of David? 
You see, that is the required response here. That is the response that leads to salvation. That is the response that each one of us needs to make for ourselves. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called The Spiritual Weight of Words. And we're going to get back to this message in just a moment as we continue to see how what we say reveals our hearts and what we say about Jesus reveals our eternal destiny. Well, if you want to get connected with Encounter the Truth, probably the best way to do that is to come and visit our website. You can learn more about this program and about Jonathan When you come to the website, you can also connect with our weekly devotional. We would love for you to come and to make that a part of your regular routine to find out more about what it means to walk with Jesus. And by the way, if you ever miss a broadcast, that's the place to go and catch up. You can come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. Having shown us the spiritual weight of our response to Jesus Christ, having shown us the impossibility of neutrality, Jesus now calls us to pay very close attention to our words. Because our words demonstrate our response to him, he tells us we must therefore watch our words. When I was growing up, we had two apple trees in our backyard behind our house. They were old apple trees. They hadn't been pruned or treated for growing apples, at least not for many, many years. In fact, they'd grown so tall, you probably couldn't prune them if you tried. They would drop huge numbers of apples, actually, in the late summer uh, and the fall every year. The ground would just kind of squelch with apples, and the wasps would swarm around. But I don't think we ever ate a single apple from those trees. They were beyond it, probably pretty rotten and decayed. Eventually, they had to come down. They're no longer there. By the time I was a child, actually, they were already near the end, unhealthy, ready to be removed. See, bad fruit, it it points to a bad tree. That's what Jesus is saying here, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, he goes on to say. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The fact that the Pharisees have evil words to say about Jesus, it points to the fact that they actually have evil hearts. To switch metaphors and images, it points to the fact that they are a brood of vipers. But this group of Pharisees, they hold a lesson for us all, and Jesus broadens the lesson, so we will take it on board. It's so important. Verse 35, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. If you want to know the state of a person's heart, listen to their mouth. If you want to know the health of a tree, look at the fruit. If there is spiritual treasure inside a person, there will be good words on their tongue. And chief of these, most telling of all, will be words spoken directly about Jesus Christ. If you want to know the state of a person's heart, listen to that person's words, and in particular, listen to what that person will say and how they will say it. Listen to their words about Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is giving us a principle here, a diagnostic that I think applies to all our speech. We should pay attention to every single word we say. He indicates that. But I think that it's right to notice that words of response to Jesus, words specifically spoken about Jesus, are centrally in view here. The whole context here of this passage, both the previous verses and, in fact, the following verses, the whole context focuses on words about Jesus, responses to Jesus Christ. And the principle we need to take on board is this. Our words reveal our heart, and most especially our words about Jesus reveal our heart toward Jesus. Do we speak of him with respect, with faith, with love, with adoration, with worship? Or as is so often the case, is his name spoken with skepticism, with scorn, with contempt? 
Jesus doesn't go into detail here discussing what it means to be a good person and what it means to be an evil person. We actually need to consider those categories a little bit more broadly in light of the gospel in order to make sense of them. The Bible teaches us that in and of ourselves, in our sin, we're all evil and we're not good. That's our natural state, sadly, this side of the fall. But Jesus, wonderfully, he is in the business of redeeming evil people, of saving sinners, of cleansing us by his blood, of filling us by his spirit. He is in the business, actually, of making evil people good through his work of redemption at the cross. And ultimately, here in verse 35, Jesus is speaking of the distinction between those who know him through the gospel and those who do not. And the key sign of whether or not Jesus has made us good through his saving work, it will be our speech. Will we confess him as Lord? Will we speak of him with love and adoration and praise? And will then our whole manner of speech be changed as a result? You may know something of the story of how the 1904 Welsh revival transformed society in Wales with remarkable speed. Huge numbers of people came to Christ in a short period of time, and the impact on communities was wonderful and almost immediate. But one rather interesting result of all this was the challenge that emerged in corralling the donkeys of the mines into action. When the miners came to Christ, these donkeys were used to pull the coal carts in the mines. The donkeys were accustomed to being spoken to in a certain way, with a certain kind of vocabulary. But when the miners turned to Christ and their speech changed, certain words were no longer employed. And the poor donkeys, they didn't know what to do. They weren't used to being spoken to in such a civil way. They had only learned profanity. You see, the Spirit of Jesus Christ had made these miners good through the gospel, and the fruit of their speech was changed. Now, seeing that speech is a telltale sign of salvation, of having been made good by Jesus, that makes sense of what Jesus goes on to say in verse 36. Notice it with me. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. On the day of judgment, evidence will be evaluated, evidence that points to salvation or the lack of salvation. Careless words will be evaluated, and words will either justify, says Jesus, or condemn. That's not to say we are saved by our speech as a good work that will impress God. No, that's not the point. But our words, crucially, our words about Jesus, our confession of faith about Him, the words we speak will either demonstrate salvation or demonstrate condemnation. And friends, what Jesus wants us to see is this, words matter. Words bear spiritual weight. Words point to the state of our heart. They are like a spiritual barometer. And so as we come to close, let me invite you, as I invite myself, let's consider our own words. Not always comfortable to do, actually. As you think about your speech, words you've uttered in recent days and weeks and months in that email, on that phone call, on social media, in that conversation, what does it say about your heart? Consider the words you speak about Jesus Christ. Are they full of skepticism? I don't know. Or are they full of belief? Are they full of cynicism? or of worship and adoration. Jesus calls you to recognize him, to confess him as Savior and as Lord. Have you done that? Will you do it even today? And what of our everyday speech? What do our words say about what's treasured up in our hearts? For some, as you look back, even on recent days, on words spoken in frustration or in anger, you see something actually you don't like. 
something that concerns you, maybe many things that concern you. You see some fruit that looks pretty unhealthy, pretty unpalatable. And maybe that is actually the spiritual warning sign that you need to recognize and you need to heed. There is a heart problem within. That's why your speech is like that. The tree actually needs new life. And that's what, that's what Jesus offers wonderfully. That's what he offers in the gospel. He offers to take rotten old hearts, to cleanse them through his blood, to make us new by his spirit, to change us from within. Is that your need today? For some, I'm sure it is. And are you ready to respond to Jesus Christ as he makes himself known? And are you ready to respond in repentance and in faith? For others, we do know Jesus already, but as we consider the fruit of our lips, you know, we find that our words don't always match our confession of faith. They don't fit really with who we are, not all the time. And so today is a wake-up call for us. Perhaps it's a rebuke for us, an opportunity to confess that before the Lord, to ask for the help of the Spirit, that our words would match our heart that has been made new by Jesus. That's a challenge, and it's something to take away and consider. But as we close, we need to rejoice here too. We need to rejoice because as I reflect on all this, one thing that encourages me and one thing that actually gives me joy is the fact that we do see so much evidence of this good treasure among us. It's actually such a joy to see how the Lord has transformed the speech of his people. It's a joy to interact with others here in our fellowship and to hear gracious words so often, to hear folks speaking kindly to each other and of one another, to hear folks speak the name of Jesus with joy, with worship, with thanksgiving, and with praise. And how different that is from the world all around us, from what we hear from others. It's evidence, isn't it? Joyful evidence that the Lord is in the business of changing hearts, of making evil people, sinful people good by the gospel. And it is, friends, a cause for rejoicing, for thanksgiving, and for praise. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Our message is called The Spiritual Weight of Words. It's from a larger series called Living as Kingdom People. And if you ever miss a broadcast in the series, you can always come to our website and listen online. Just stop by EncounterTheTruth.org and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Another way to listen is through the Encounter the Truth app. It's free and you'll find it at your favorite app store. Simply go there and search for Encounter the Truth. Or again, our website, if you prefer to listen online, it's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is listener-supported. That's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity and your financial support to keep this program going. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Bob Lapine. It's called The Four Emotions of Christmas. And Jonathan, how would you encourage those who listen and give to use this book when they receive it? Well, I think Christmas is just the most wonderful opportunity to share the hope that we have in Christ with those around us, with our our friends and loved ones, with our co-workers, with our neighbors. And it's often helpful to have a resource to share with folk at Christmas. And I want to commend to you this resource. We're trusting that it'll be helpful to you as you seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ this Christmas with those around you. And I think one of the great strengths of this little book is the fact that it connects with people people's emotional realities, where they're at. We know that Christmas is often an emotionally complex time, and this little book engages with those realities and points us to the Lord Jesus Christ to find hope and joy in Him at Christmas. And I trust you'll be able to use this and give it away that others will find joy and hope in Christ this year. Well, we want to send you a copy of this book, The Four Emotions of Christmas, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. You can give over the phone by calling us at 833-998-7884. That's 833-99-TRUTH. Or go online and give through our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. 
www.jethingriffiths.org. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.